Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to episode 258 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. I hope you guys had a fantastic holiday season, but it's my experience as a psychologist that whatever mental health challenges that you have during the holiday season, those symptoms tend to amplify. As many of you know, a big part of my practice is helping individuals who are, who are struggling with eating disorders and disordered eating. And from Halloween to post January 1st, that's the time that many of my clients struggle. That's why I thought it would be a fantastic opportunity to invite a colleague of mine to come talk about this topic with you. We're going to talk about the relationship between self-image, body image, sexuality. We're going to talk about food addiction. We're also going to talk about what can you do to promote positive lifestyle without triggering your eating disorders. Robin is one of the wonderful dietitian that I know in Los Angeles, and she's been supporting many, many of our clients in the community. Our guest today is Robin Goldberg. Robin began her career at Cedar sinai Medical Center in LA as the inpatient dietitian in the Department of Cardiology. Over the last 24 years, she has developed her own private practice in Beverly Hills, California, where she specializes in medical conditions, disorder eating, eating disorders, health at every size, pre-pregnancy nutrition, and people in recovery. Robin is the author of the new book, The Eating Disorder Trap, a guide for clinicians and loved ones, and the host of the podcast, The Eating Disorder Trap Podcast. If you find this conversation helpful, but it's not necessarily applicable to you, I think it would be very powerful if you forward it, send it to someone that might benefit from this information. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Robin Goldberg. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited and honored to have Robin Goldberg on our show. Robin, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me, Nazanin. I really appreciate it. I'm excited about this conversation. I actually know about Robin's work from the world of eating disorder recovery. I know you're very active in that realm and you recently launched your book, which received all, all sorts of raving reviews. So we're excited to have you here. Thank you. So tell us, I know you're a dietitian. You've worked for years with people who are struggling with eating disorders. I know you have also supported people from recovery from substances. So you have a, a broad range of experiences. So tell us, based on your experience, how is our relationship between food and sexuality that are related? Well, one, one of the pieces I would say is if a person is not eating regularly or taking in enough food, their desire to be intimate or have a libido gradually diminishes before it's fully gone. And I think oftentimes people don't realize, you know, we always hear about food and mood, but I think just having cravings and desires, that's a part of it as well. So there's clients I see that struggle with binge eating disorder and they restrict and they binge and they find that they have, you know, they're dysregulated with their emotions and they can't understand why. And I think it's similar to just their sexual desire and interest as well. It's sort of like if you're not putting logs in a furnace or logs in a campfire regularly, it will eventually fizzle out. And I think that's how it is with you know one's desire and interest for anything, sexuality, or just they become more flatlined. Absolutely, you're right. And it can be very kind of like multi-layered. So piece of it is like, I can even see like when people are changing their diets, when they're trying to diet my non-eating sort of clients, it impacts your mood and our moods and our sexuality are related when we're angry, hungry, irritated. 
it's more uh, less likely for us to want to have sex or our partner might not approach us as much and our hormones can change if we restrict for a long time. Well, I was going to say, Nazanin, you know, a good point that you brought up too is when people are trying different food regimes, if they're not eating enough carbohydrates, if they're not eating enough fat, if, you know, any, any macronutrient that they're not getting enough of, they're not going to have energy to even think about being intimate. If they don't have enough fat in their diet, their lubrication dries up. I mean, we don't think about the direct correlation between what we eat and how we physically may or may not respond. Absolutely. And I know sometimes people have this complicated relationship with the food and uh, with food and it, that impacts their kind of like their body image, self image, and that can also directly impact their willingness to have sex with someone else. And I think the other piece is that people, they don't think about it much. It doesn't, what, when people think about eating disorder, they think about someone that's, they are kind of like at the level of impatient. And there's, as, as you know, more than me, that there are so many misconceptions around body type and who's sick and who's not and politics around that. But it's my experience, even with my sexual health clients, when they come in, our disordered eating stories and narratives are so pervasive. Many people would fall in a disordered eating range because of fad diets that they're following. And you don't need to have a full-blown diagnosis of eating disorder to kind of like think about your diet and your relationship with your sexuality. It's true. I mean, the research shows one out of three people who diet develop an eating disorder. And I would imagine over time, especially over the last year and a half, plus the pandemic, that statistic will be greater. It will change because I I think there is so much about whether it's our focus, whether it's our body being able to embrace just love and wanting to be connected. There's so, so many issues that can pop up and they're not necessarily discussed regularly by people that are dieting and struggles that they are having centered around intimacy and connection. Absolutely. And, you know, when I talk about people's relationship with food, at times I hear people use this term food addiction. What do you think about that? So the term quote unquote food addiction is a very controversial term in the eating disorder community. And, you know, one of the statements is that, you know, we can't be addicted to something we need to survive. So when people will say, oh, I'm addicted to sugar. And I'll say, oh, do you mean if you were to sit with a jar of sugar, you wouldn't be able to stop eating you know, spoonful after spoonful? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm referring to baked goods and frozen desserts and candy, et cetera. I think, well, oftentimes if a person feels powerless and out of control, chances are they're lacking something else in their diet. They're not getting enough carbohydrates. They're not having enough fat in in their diet. And so their cravings will be more intensified for these various foods and food groups. What a great point you brought up, because what I hear from my clients are coming in and they say some of them that, you know, I have this urges that I can't control. And when we're talking about what they eat and why don't eat, they, it seems like they've been, and I'm sure you see that all the time, restricting extremely during the day. And then their body have like have this urge, strong urges, because we want to help them to survive. And doesn't mean like there's something psychologically wrong with them. That's kind of like their physiological responses. And we are bombarded with diet culture on what to do. And I feel like every five years, there's new trend and people are judging you in a way for what you're eating and kind of like connecting it to who you are. And there's so many people that even around us, as you said, this statistic, one out of three are struggling with eating disorder, or they are having a problematic relationship with food because of their presentation is not what's quote unquote, traditional people are not paying attention to that. So tell us who is at risk for developing an eating disorder? Anyone, (laughs) any age, any gender, any body shape or size is at risk for developing an eating disorder. And I think too often, Nazim, we hear people say like, oh, it's only in young cisgender Caucasian females, which is not the case, actually. The most common eating disorder that's discussed the least are those struggling with binge eating disorder. That is the most common eating disorder. 
And you, you see it as well as I do. I mean, it's very common in the non-binary, brown skin, people of color, older adults. The, I actually went to Washington, D.C. before COVID. I lobbied on Capitol Hill with the Eating Disorder Coalition. And the Medicare population is actually the fastest growing population to develop eating disorders. And people are like, really? Not possible. And it could be they're an empty nester. They've had something tragic in their life happen, whether it's a partner pass away or they've gotten laid off. I've seen quite a bit of this over the last year of older people being laid off because companies can hire younger people for less money. Something that's just been so unexpected that this has rocked their world. And maybe they had disordered eating and thinking in the past, or they've had a history, quote unquote, of an eating disorder, and they never sought out treatment or had a consistent team that they were working with. And then their routine changed and then their eating disorder erupted. So any person that is living and breathing is at risk for developing an eating disorder. Well, I, I'm glad that you you mentioned that. I had a client a long time ago that she she started having a really bad kind of like experience, bad anorexia nervosa, actually passed her menopause years because what happened is she got divorced and she wanted to get a perfect body to be able to date. So that was that kind of like created that dieting pattern that led her to have kind of like eating disorder, kind of like which required higher level of care and inpatient and all of that. So I, I like that you're talking about and bring awareness that any of us can develop an eating disorder. And it's important to pay attention to the pattern and your relationship with the food. It's not something that's not treatable. There are solutions, treatment, but the earlier you notice a pattern, the better you will be with kind of like preventing it or treating it. So I know that the next conversation I have with people at times is that I'm sure you have the same experience. They say, you know, but I don't like my body. What should I do? <laughs> so if people don't like their body. <laughs> question, a million dollar question. <laughs> what can they do that's not harming them? It's not harmful, but helps them to kind of take steps toward changing or becoming happier with their body. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even say quote unquote, changing, I think it's really going to the internal of what's leading them to feel that way, because we're constantly bombarded with messages through society stating that if we don't eat a certain way or look a certain way, we've done something wrong versus being able to just be a little kinder and understanding and compassionate to ourselves with being able to create a narrative that helps us it's like what I'm actually needing. Maybe it's not about the food. And, and also, this is so cliche, and, and you've you know heard the statement you know thousands of times, Azanine, is like learning how to be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, really learning how to be comfortable with those uncomfortable feelings because we're not meant to remain the same as, as we age. Our bodies change and learning how to embrace aging, whether it be gray hair, cellulite, sagging skin. I mean, all these things that happen to all of us and being able to say, you know what, I want to be the best I can be for me and realize that I am changing because we're not meant to look as we did when we were 20 years old. And, you know, what's shocking at time is that when I get couples in my practice, then sometimes some in heterosexual relationships, women feel the pressure from their partner that's saying that they don't like the partner's body. They even they offer to pay for surgery, all those sorts of things, can, which is very painful to hear as someone that also works with eating disorder. But I can see people are at tough places with this. Like they want to have kind of connecting sex with their partner. And the message they're hearing is just so unkind. Have you had those conversations with your clients? Day in and day out. I mean, <laughs> with, with women that are going through menopause, bodies change. There's no way to avoid it. And I was on the phone with someone today that had you know called and was like, well, I know women going through menopause whose bodies don't change. And I said, well, I would be willing to bet that they don't have a completely normal relationship with food. 
as it's very common to be able to develop weight in the midsection. And it's actually viewed as like a survival place from the standpoint of like when an individual is not gaining weight and their body is not changing, their bone density actually decreases. It's, it's basically been stated as like the weight in the midsection is a life preserver to help a woman maintain her bone density. And not to feel like, oh, I'm surrendering and throwing in the towel, but to be able to say, oh, what are things I can do that make me feel comfortable and positive within myself, whether they're engaging in you know, intuitive movement, that they like how it makes their body feel, they're be being able to make food choices mindfully, that they like the taste of and they enjoy how it makes their body feel physically and emotionally. I think it's important to you know, realize that we do have cravings, but also realize too, that a person could overconsume kale, just like they can overconsume burgers. Well, I, I like the message of moderation. And I feel that's something that you can do all stages of your life as your body changes. Although I feel sometimes people use moderation as a, a label to when you're talking to them, they're like restricting all sorts of food, and they're just labeling it moderation. But I like that you're talking about kind of like paying attention to your internal craving. And kind of realizing that your body changes and that's natural part of life and uh, focusing on doing things that makes you feel good in your skin. So I know that you, uh, you work with health at every size approach. How effective do you see this approach is and what are some of the components of it? Well, I see working from a health at every size approach as being super effective because I, I think for all the person that's receptive and open to it is the person who realizes that diets and quick fixes are not the answer, that they want to be able to explore what, as I was starting to say before, like what forms of movement are physically and emotionally satisfying. Maybe it's gardening is their form of movement versus going on a treadmill doesn't necessarily seem pleasurable and enjoyable versus putting on music and dancing. So it's being able to say just in day-to-day -day life, like if we don't move, we become stiff. We find getting out of bed in the morning, we feel a little achy and not as limber or even to walk up a flight of stairs or exhausted. I think just to be able to carry groceries or to bend down and tie your shoe. We take these things for granted when we have the privilege of being able to do this when we're younger or in different you know, body sizes that can give us the privilege to be able to do it regularly. And if we don't practice moving, then it becomes difficult with any aspect of movement. It doesn't have to be the, the gym is what I'm saying. It's just being able to move in a way that's not hurting your body. So you can bend down in your refrigerator and, you know, take something out on the, the lower freezer. We, we don't think about that. So that's one, you know, element of haze, being able to treat people of all body shapes and genders and sizes equally. Like sometimes there's providers that don't make the same recommendation to a person in a smaller body as to what they would say to a person in a larger body. So really being able to find providers that can align with understanding with where you're at and treat all people equally the same. Being able to, again, work from the inside out in regards to what foods do I like? What foods do, you know, give me the energy that I'd hope or being able to focus or allow me to connect and engage with myself without feeling, okay, when I'm alone, I can really eat what it is that I want. Because the thing is too, when a person is mindful about what foods make them physically and emotionally feel satisfying. There's times they're like, yeah, you know what? I love having French fries and I'm going to have it as, you know, as often as I'm having these other foods. But the more that we're demonizing a specific food or food group, we'll oftentimes have feelings of guilt, shame, or remorse and being able to learn how to make peace with all these various foods. I mean, these are just some of the, the principles from a Hayes perspective. And Again, a person that wants to change their thought process because maybe they've been raised being told that they're not allowed to eat X, Y, and Z, or they, you know, their their scene is not being accepted by their family if they live in a larger body, and and really learning how to explore where those narratives came from and what they could do with being able to change those narratives so they can view themselves differently. I love that. I think you brought up so many great points. One is that some provide that are not necessarily have this approach they they recommend things and have biases when they see people in larger bodies which is 
so unfortunate and they're kind of create like there we have collectively create this environment at times that put people in the place of kind of like doing choosing to do unhealthy things that kind of impact their sex life relationship and many things so people shrink and their support system shrinks their relationships shrinks and that's that's not necessarily a healthy way of leaving so uh, i i like that you're kind of like talking about that aspect but i just want to say too as mean that haze the emphasis is not about changing one's body it's working on how to accept where their body is naturally meant to be when they're encompassing principles of what's working for them on a physical level and an emotional level well I think my understanding is exactly what you said, that it's about kind of like getting in peace, becoming in peace with your kind of like with the food, with your body and acceptance is a big piece of it. And I love that you talked about movement and that with movement that can bring so much joy. And when you are in a joyful phase, then you're more willing to have sex. You're more connected with life. So I think that's, that's definitely a positive thing. And with kind of like extreme dieting, that can become your whole focus and fixation. And that can take away so many other important things in life. But I think many women are conditioned to think about when they think about sex, they think about how kind of like I need to have certain kind of body in order to be sexual. But it's my experience, the more that you're connecting with pleasure and joy, that can enhance your experience of sexuality inside and outside the bedroom so for our listeners that they are listening do you have a recommendation if they are curious if they have eating disorder or not they notice some patterns do you have a recommendation on how they can assess that themselves well there's there's a number of surveys i mean there's the, well for, first and foremost i actually have in my book those eating disorder surveys and they could they could do the eat questionnaire but but also i would i would go onto the nita website because the the nita website has some simple questions that a person could could explore within themselves but but also i think an important question is if they're thinking about you know to be able to ask yourself like out of a 24 hour period from when i'm awake how many of my waking hours am i thinking about food in my body i mean that would be i think a red flag to to think about and actually yeah so the eating attitude test which a person can go online and actually have it in my book so it's the attitude test it's the eat 26 i mean that's like a pretty straightforward one because then there's the scoff, I mean, that's more clinical, but the, the eat attitude test would be one that a person could look at online. Excellent. So speaking of your book, I know you recently published your book, Eating Sword Trap. So tell us more about that. So our listeners who are interested about this, they can they can kind of purchase it and read it. So my my book was developed over a four-year period, actually. I wanted to write a book that was different from the other books in our field where I have four expert eating disorder physicians in it and two well-known eating disorder therapists. I felt like in those specific chapters, it would add more credibility. And it's written in a very basic manner that you don't have to be a clinician in the field. So it's written for the layman person, our clients, their families, coaches, religious figures, as well as mental health care providers and dietitians and physicians that are not trained in eating disorders or new to the eating disorder field. So the book also, I will just say, has a number of illustrations that are all non-gender, all body shapes and sizes, because some of the titles, person who may not understand, you know, the, the details in our field, say, so, okay, it has a catchy title, but then there's an illustration, a fun cartoon to be able to encompass what's what's happening. There's four sections of the book. There's the getting to know Ed, which is the eating disorder, and just a few basic statistics about it. It's being able to explore like how much time a person is speaking and, and engaging with someone that may or may not have an eating disorder, because oftentimes the coaches and teachers spend more time with someone who has an eating disorder than a family member due to being in school and, and practice. And then there's all these different types of eating disorders, as you know, Nazanin, and unfortunately, for billing purposes, super bills for insurance, clinician like you and I have to be able to give a diagnosis, but sometimes a person has multiple eating disorders or one 
morphs into another. So it's discussing briefly like what all these different types of eating disorders actually are. So this is all within my first section. My second section, I get into all the problems with BMI and breaking that down and deconstructing it and other ways to assess if a person is quote unquote healthy or or not. You know, we talk about what is normal and all the different variations of that from, you know, with lab tests, from, you know, how a person appears, I mean, and getting into all the specific layers that then there's the nutrition interview, the role of the registered dietitian, questions that they would be asking in sessions, someone who is a skilled eating disorder clinician. And I think that's super helpful, especially for mental health care providers to really understand what someone like me does in multiple sessions. Then my next uh, chapter in this section is every medical complication that can happen from We don't realize, you know, how the heart, how the brain, how the liver, how the kidneys, everything is is impacted and with all catchy, fun titles. And again, just kind of hitting it to a point that a person realizes like everything is impacted and there's no organ or body part spared. And then there's part three in the book, which gets into every macronutrient. I call that section the big macro. And, you know, I talk about all the misconceptions about carbohydrates, proteins, and fats and what's important for people to know about why it's necessary to have them all in our diet, as well as discussing water, how too much, not enough problems that can happen there. And then the fourth section of the book is about the the road to recovery and compassion as what we were discussing a little bit today and the role of the eating disorder voice and what that looks like. And then being able to work with your team and who to trust and how to be able to create a team. Well, it sounds like this can be a resource for a number of different people who are curious about whether eating disorder, the struggle with eating disorder or not, or if you have a family member that you're struggling, or I know many of our listeners are fellow professional mental health providers and health providers. So it can give them this kind of resource of kind of what kind of things they they can do to support people, or at least kind of like have some kind of conversation about this thing. Because I, I know that many clinicians, when they think about eating disorder, they feel they're not well prepared, at least now they can use the book as a guidance on what to do next. And it seems like it gives this overview of about this multidisciplinary approach that many eating disorder clinicians have. Definitely. And if you know someone would like to find the book, so there's the book website, which is the eating disorder trap dot com and then my private practice website which is askaboutfood.com and the book actually is available on Amazon, Book Logix, Barnes and Noble. I have an it's on Audibles, it's an audio book and all those options are, are on the, the book website. And then I you know, have been working on promoting it on my social media, which my Instagram is Robin with a Y, Goldberg RDN, and my Twitter is Robin with a Y RDN as well. Awesome. And I didn't know it's the audible. Did you read the book yourself? I am the narrator. Oh, yes. awesome. Oh, then then that must that's a must. <laughs> yeah. And, and yes, and then I have my my podcast, which your guest on the Eating Disorder Trap podcast. But yes, I am the narrator for the book. Wonderful. And definitely the podcast is another wonderful resource that people check out if they are interested to gather more information about eating disorder recovery. Robin, this was such a delightful conversation. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing your expertise with us. And if people are curious about the book and the resources, the link will be in the show notes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nazanin. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I hope you guys found our conversation meaningful and it gave you some pointer on how you can work through some of your challenges with food during this season. If you know someone that they're struggling, offering resources to them if they are open can be a great way of supporting them. You can send them this episode and that can be a helpful way of offering some meaningful ways for them to 
work through the challenges that they have. And Robin and I, we've both been doing this for a while. And we also would be happy to offer you any any additional resource that you might need. Before we close our conversation today, I have some great, exciting news. It's exciting for me, and I hope it is exciting for you as well. We just passed 2 million downloads, and I did this questionnaire survey on my Instagram account, and I asked people how would they like us to celebrate them. And many of you guys recommended that you you wanted us to do an episode purely on question and answer. I'm going to record it in next couple of weeks. So if you have a question that you want us to answer it, make sure you are heading to sexologypodcast.com, pressing on the purple tab on the homepage and record your question there. And I'll answer every single question that I get that's recorded on the episode. If you are sending me your written questions, I'll answer most of them on my Instagram live. So make sure you're following us at Sexology Podcast on Instagram and I'll answer some of the questions there, the written ones, some there, some here, but for the audio recordings, I'll answer them here. I cannot wait to hear your questions and it would be my honor and pleasure to help you get some answers and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.